first time I was ever here, I was in my pyjamas. Thick, wincyette, unfashionable. That's before you say, the pyjamas, not me. My brother had sent a distress signal. Take me home, oh mother father, take me home, for those of you who remember that song. But it wasn't any old summer camp. It was militant summer camp. Strikes me you shouldn't even be able to say that without being forced to do so in Alexi Sale's voice. He'd sent a distress signal from militant summer camp. Militant, you may not even remember, the loony left as the Thatcherite press of the time um, christened them. But through the thick but gradually thinning geographical fog that characterises all of our childhoods and adolescences, the forest swam either side of the car as we were driven down in the middle of the night to pick my brother up because for whatever reason, I imagine he doesn't even remember himself now, he could no longer stand to be at militant summer camp. And I became vaguely aware of the area for the first time under those somewhat unusual circumstances. My third encounter with the forest was nearly a decade later in the early 90s. As that previous tale comes from 1982, I'd been fished out of my sleep like a much younger child. I was 14 at the time, but still clad in pyjamas and still not trusted to stay at home. By the dawn of the 90s, for pop socio reasons that I will not bore you with, the uh, Gloucestershire band EMF had started to rear their heads on the Stourbridge skyline. And this ended up with a whole bunch of us going down to Cinderford Working Men's Club. But it's the second of those encounters with the forest that provides the crucial backdrop for our visit today. It occurred, as is so often the case for me and those of my generation, via proxy, via the luminous cathode portal of television. I was sat in a breeze block clad room in Liverpool, my first year at university, 1989. Watching the rerun, reruns of much vaunted programmes were a big deal back then, of Dennis Potter's seminal drama, Pennies from Heaven, from 1978. Only a few years previously, and yet it occurs to me that it was cloaked in those two earlier eras, the 30s in which it is set, and the 70s in which it was made, both of them ricocheting back and forth for me through that thinly lifting fog of geographical perception. Bob Hoskins's character, Arthur, a hapless, frustrated music salesman, pursues and seduces Cheryl Campbell's innocent schoolteacher into the forest. And there it is, as Potter said, just accidentally a heart-shaped place between two rivers. Over the ensuing years, I got to see all of Potter's work and appearances, up to, including, and past that Melvin Bragg interview from 1994. Luminous, phosphorescent, transparent, in fact, with the power and light of impending death. His works have come to cohere, elucidate, and even sanction so many of my ideas and beliefs. So thanks, Dennis. This one's for you. Potter talks in that interview about the first 14 years of your life being the crucible of your being. And yet, I understand that Larkin-esque idea, that unique random blend of families and fashions that constitutes us all. And I understand also that the idea of arriving fully formed is central to a lot of his artistic ideas, a lot of his political identity of being something other than a corporate product. 
But at the same time, during that early period of your life, not just childhood and adolescence, but your young manhood, your young womanhood, you flail around, don't you? You've, you've walked into the room halfway through the radio broadcast and you're searching here and there, anywhere, for kindling with which to flame into being. And you know those moments when someone on telly says something that you thought, but you thought that only you thought it. And it suddenly occurs to you that not only did he or she think it, but everyone probably thinks it. And I remember Potter doing that for me at the Edinburgh lecture before that interview about this place, Canop Ponders, just by where his father worked in one of the pit shafts, one of the five pit shafts in the forest, where he said that this for him was where Jesus walked on water and how he clothed all of those other biblical references, those references from the Psalms, with places that he knew. And this for me was my Mary Stevens Park, where I had situated Dad's army, the end credits. I put half of uh, the John Pertwee era from Doctor Who on Mary Stevens Park and Timber Edge and Clint and Norton Cupboard near me. I've done the same thing for Captain Scarlet. He becomes immortal in the multi-storey car park in Stourbridge. And we all do it. And that was one of my first major footholds onto that great inverted pyramid of consciousness that we all get to climb. Um, great inverted pyramid of consciousness? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. pyramids of consciousness aside, it's just occurred to me how apt it is that Potter, born in the mid-30s, had to clothe the images that he encountered in those little orange floppy bound hymn books, whereas the congregation born in the mid-60s, of which I am a part, had to do the same for the sounds and sights that rebounded in the naves of their living room, staring entranced at the great mystery of the high altar of television. Walk through Berry Hill today, where Potter grew up, and a lot that he would have recognised has gone. Certainly that Zionist chapel at the top of the hill, with its floppy orange covered hymn books, is no more. But he might have recognised one or two things. For instance, that. So then, Harris, when it's my turn to walk in the shadow of the Valley of Death, what do you think they're going to paint on the side of the shrubbery cottage, Old Swinford? Which of our episodes? Yeah, which thumbnail? Tipton. Oh, so Tipton. Nothing wrong with Tipton, but is it really our singing detective? Yeah. OK. So visually celebrated here in Colford, the nearest town of any size to Berry Hill. It's a not unattractive place, one of those towns for me that reminds me of a lot of other places. A little bit up to non seven with that strange truncated stranded tower in the middle, a little of a, a landlocked seaside feel. Uh, the Georgian or semi Georgian square ringing the town in, in canted angles some reason thinking of Farringdon in Oxfordshire, a hundred other places at least. It's also got that feel that a lot of small southern towns and a lot of towns in the far east have got of having no outlying districts in the modern sense of the world, of being as towns were when I was a child, places like Horncastle um, and Spilsby in Lincolnshire, they stop more or less at the end of the high street. 
there's no great encroaching army of commerce, of pets at home, and Dunelm, and all of the homogenous forces that encroach on so many towns in the West Midlands. Um, I think it's a really nice, uh, I think it's, it's nicely photorealistic, I think that works, given the visual medium, certainly, of Potter's work, and I think it's well chosen in terms of the quotation. I know it sounds daft, Eileen, but I want to live in a world where the songs come true. Daft, of course, in uh, Bob Hoskins's um, cadence and uh, an accent. But how he would have felt seeing himself leering from the side of a building, I don't know. How would you feel? Be as honest as you can, Lee. How would you feel if you came upon the side of a house in Wensfield well, and there you were, either living or in an imaginary afterlife? Yeah, I mean, I think for a writer, I think a lot of writers would, I guess, be happy to have a posthumous life, yeah. wouldn't they? Yeah, um, certainly. I'm not a writer. No. Um, I think my younger self would have been horrified. Yeah. Uh, now, I think a part of me would be secretly kind of, uh, ple vaguely pleased, but also find it slightly ridiculous. Yes. Yeah. 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 In the sense, the, the absurd sense of our own self. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 And yourself? I think I'd feel a little bit like I did when Coming to Your Way um, was first put up on the internet, okay? Absolutely horrified for about a minute and then really pleased. I remember with a strange kind of clarity the days before my daughter was born, my first child, and time was not normal. It had a cumulative, incremental sense, a countdown, imposed by the expectant parents, I know, but palpable, almost physical. I was in a church in Fishtoft in Lincolnshire near Boston last week talking to the vicar who was glad of the company and someone who was interested in his lovely church but his kind words began to fade as my eye traveled out through the stained glass and the clear glass across the fields and I was reminded of that expectant time before Hannah before Hannah's face became something that I couldn't forget and I thought about the huge acreage of cumulative time that ended when I was born. And then I thought about the huge, huge, huge acreage of cumulative time that doesn't end after I die. And I felt a huge, soaring, lunging, swelling longing not to leave all of this, to continue to be and to say that I was there. Dennis Potter talked about a sense of vocation a great deal of the time. A sense of having to do what he has to do. And I think anyone who feels any sort of creative urge is saying simply that, I am here, I was here, I occupied this particular sliver of time that ended and began and I want you to recognise that. I don't know who you are or you will be. Philip Larkin, again, says that death is no different wind at than withstood. So why then are we so much more impressed when someone withstands than winds? Because Dennis Potter certainly withstood. He, David Bowie, Leonard Cohen, they used their deaths as artistic commodities they channeled into them. I was talking earlier about being phosphorescent, transparent with the power of impending death, but we all are. But those three knew it and they knew how to use it in different ways, all indicative of their own artistic and personal character. 
the most obvious is Potter, Len and Dave. You could have been forgiven for thinking they were just carrying on. Listen to You Want It Darker. Oh, it's Len being miserable again. Look at Dark Star, although it's absolutely screamingly obvious after the fact what it's about with its heads and skulls separating, soaring off into space. But you think, hey, it's Dave being weird again. Good, welcome back, Dave. So they almost got it past us, and you can feel them smiling at that because you know that they knew that that was, that was going to be our perception of it. But, but Dennis Potter signposts it, he announces it, he gives you cold Lazarus. He lives on into the future in his work explicitly. And there is a need for that. There was an artist who died in 2014 called An Kawara who used to produce pieces of work that simply said, I am still alive. Clearly in the knowledge that at one point he would no longer be. And I don't want to go. I don't want to leave. Life is, is painful at times. Suffering exists. We all know this. But I don't want to leave the sudden prismatic September light on the ferns. I don't want to leave those strange guttering fields in Lincolnshire. I don't want to leave the rain on a train window or huddled inside a calf on a February afternoon. The band of purple in a January sky. A television screen blinking on or off. A thousand, thousand, thousand things that have made up all of the facets of texture of the particular sliver of space-time that Dan Cummings came and saw. I want you to know that I was there because I was. Actually, do you know what we've forgotten to do? What? 
we haven't mentioned the business of Sting replacing Michael Kitchen and Steve Martin replacing Bob Hoskins in the American versions of Brimstone and Treacle and Pennies from Heaven. Should we do it now? We can't. Why not? Because the only person we're allowed to be nasty about is Colin Farrell. Yeah, you're right, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. Good point. So obviously those were the three artists that came to my mind, um, Potter himself, Cohen and, uh, and David Bowie. Is there anyone else you can think of who, who revelled in, in the, the power of death artistically? I don't know if revelled would be the right word no. uh, for either of these artists and also slightly different in that it wasn't concerning their own deaths, um, but I think Nick Cave in oh, right, recent yeah. times, yeah. Uh, Ghosting yeah. album. Um, which is uh, a mighty piece of work, yeah. as are uh, other things he's done recently as well. Um, and the other one that, that strikes me from the last decade or so is Sufjan Stevens. About uh, whom I know perilously little, it no, has to be said. Uh, he did an album called Carrie and Lowell, which is about his mum and his stepdad dying. Uh, and it's, it's maybe my favourite album of the last decade or so, or certainly one of them. Um, but I have thought many times that a lot of the records I'm listening to, uh, or you know, a portion of what I've been mm. listening to in recent years, Bowie's Black Star. Yeah. I listened to You Want It Darker. Yeah. Uh, a few times, and, and, and Sufjan Stevens and Nick Cave. He, he's concerned with the subject. I don't know if it's to do with our, our, you know, sort of middle age and and the fact that we're perhaps a little bit more receptive to the yeah. idea. I don't know. Actually, we've we've talked about yeah. it. And, this is going to sound really miserable, but we've talked about death quite a lot yeah. lately, yeah. and in, in in no way in a miserable way. No. You know, there's the there's the Billy Connolly thing from yeah. a couple of Christmases ago. He did something on the BBC, and he was talking about his Parkinson's, and he talked about how when you're little, you're given all these things, you're given senses and abilities, yeah. and now he's at the other end of his life, and he, he's slowly things away. are being taken yeah. away. Yeah. And he wasn't saying it in any kind of a moaning or miserableist way. He just said, "I find that really fascinating." Yeah, as an observer. Uh, yeah. yeah. Brilliant, and he had all these complaints about it. Yeah. Well, actually, uh, nobody should be complaining about him talking eloquently in, in a in a quite positive way well, no, it's, uh, it's about the experience of death it's or, or approaching it. It's looking at it straight in the face, though, isn't it? Um, and, and I was talking earlier about that um, that thinning geographical fog. I know this doesn't seem related, but when you are again, you know, that feeling of having walked in halfway through the broadcast, halfway through the program, when you are young facts, figures, facets of the world begin to, to appear out of the fog, don't you? And you, you reach just in the thirties and you feel like you've got a, a pretty good idea mm. of where everything fits in. Um, and I suppose that light intensifies and intensifies and death is the point at which it is it, at its most intense. It can get no brighter. That's the, that's the, the mm. last thing yeah. to yeah. illuminate. Yeah. And people don't want yeah. to look at it as a result, do they? Yeah. Um, you know, they, they say that the, yeah. the, that is the last taboo, mm. don't they? That mm. the Victorians mm. um, yeah. had taboos about yeah. all sorts of things that we didn't, yeah. but that we have yeah. a greater taboo about death. Absolutely. I think Absolutely. that might be true. But um, as, as I was saying to you the other day, um, just as we lose the last two or three members of our audience yeah yeah um, you know that uh, yeah. that idea of, of sort of we watched Potter's interview again and then that idea of sort of terminal illness yeah. knowing it's imminent yeah you know but actually I, I do think it's quite um, useful actually just to think we are all terminally ill that I think that is literally true yeah um, and again, not, not meaning to be miserable about that. I think, I think it's quite something that really sharpens the mind for that idea. Yeah, it's yeah. happening. It's inevitable. And um, you've got to live in the moment, like Potter said in the interview. Yeah. He talks about the present tense that's constantly, there, doesn't he? There truly Writing is. Writing yeah. and living in yeah. the present tense. Yeah. That's a beautiful thing. Yeah. You know, it's just one other thing I'd say. Um, you were just saying you want people to know that yeah. you were there, that yeah. this was Dan Cummings' this sort of portion of it or whatever, yeah. you know, um, and actually I think most people feel like that, don't they, but I'm going to pose a different view that actually I'm trying to approach a point where I'm thinking I don't care, 
I do not care after I'm dead what anybody thinks. I don't care what's played at my funeral. I don't care what people. I care what people think. I do care right. what people think. But I'm, I actually, yeah, to be forgotten, I think is 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 perfectly fine. I, I use fine because used it's an inevitability. I used to want to be stuffed and put in the cake stand in the mitre in Stourbridge, <laughs> um, going revolving round with those rather limp cakes that used to go. Um, go on a, a, a cylindrical um, journey every day which is a little bit like what well it's actually nothing at all like what mad jack fuller the victorian oh, yeah. eccentric who was buried inside yeah. his pyramid in um brighton stone well um, I, and um go on sorry i say i mm. i know people i can pull strings up and get you on that right oh, right, okay, okay. <laughs> fair enough right yeah yeah it wasn't brighton stone was it that was the ancient village of the ancient village the um the former village of Brighton, but we digress within a digression within a digression, which is our want. Um, so, yeah, indeed.